Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Let me just say welcome, good morning, so glad that you are here today, particularly if you're a guest or a first timer, really glad you came. Everybody take your Bible, let's go to Genesis chapter 12, and if you didn't bring a Bible, why don't you just uh, raise your hand and the ushers are coming in both rooms, they'll be glad to let you borrow one if you need one to hang on to, and everybody can find the verse because it's just right there at the very start, Genesis 12. And uh, that's where we'll go in just a few moments. So I'll tell you this. Sigmund Freud said plenty of things that I would disagree with. But I believe he was spot on when he said the urge towards self-preservation resides at the core of human nature. Self-preservation. This is true. You see this starting in childhood with your little child who you ask point blank, did you eat that cookie I told you not to eat? And the child reflexively says, no, liar. Why did you say that? Self-preservation. We've been seeing that even in this week's news over and over, person after person saying less prison time, immunity, Surely I have something that we could talk about, self-preservation. I was thinking back to um, several decades ago when I was in seminary, working on my uh, master's degree to become an ordained minister. Um, And so there I was in uh, graduate school, I think it was second year, and I was taking a New Testament course that was helpful in most every way. The lectures were interesting, the research papers were stimulating and challenging, and most of the reading was worthwhile, except one book. It It was a book that was a thousand pages long by the British theologian called Guthrie, Donald Guthrie. And at the end of the semester, when we took our finals, we had to fill out a little card saying, Uh, that we had read all of our collateral reading, which for this course was two or 3,000 pages worth. So I turned in the card and wrote all red, which felt great, except it wasn't all true. I should have written all red, except for the dry, boring, tooth-pulling, painful, better than ambient tome by Guthrie. But I didn't write that because I figured even God wasn't able to finish that book himself. So I turned the card in and for the next 72 hours between that card being turned in and my car being packed up to drive home from Kentucky for the summer, my conscience kept asking me this question, why? Why did you write that? Because that wasn't true. And then I began to wrestle with the question at an even deeper level. Now, how can you realistically plan on asking God to bless your ministry when you cheated your way through seminary? And I really couldn't come up with a good answer for that one. And so before driving out of town, I took the walk of shame across the campus to the administration building where that professor officed. He was not just a New Testament professor, he was also the provost of the whole faculty. And I knocked on his door and he leaned over. Mr. Werlein, you're still in town. Yes. How can I help you? Come in. I said, well, I was wondering if we could just talk for a moment. And he said, sure, sit down. I said, well, you know, you asked us to fill that card in, uh, confirming that we'd read all of our collateral reading. Yes, of course. I said, well, I, I wrote all read, but that wasn't all right because I didn't get it all read. He said, okay, well, uh, what were your not able to finish uh, the Guthrie book. He said, well, how much did you read? I said, 43 pages, give or take. It it, it (laughs) was an awkward moment. He said, Mr. Werlein, this this is a problem. It's a problem for three reasons. Number one, I've already submitted the grades and they'll be coming out now. Number two, it's a problem because it wouldn't be fair for you to make the A that it says you're going to receive 
if you didn't finish your collateral reading, well, many of your colleagues are not going to make an A, but they did finish their collateral reading. And number three, it's a problem because it's not fair to you to go through New Testament without reading the magisterial work of Guthrie. On that one, I was willing to concede. Sometimes life just isn't fair, but I didn't say that. Now, I suspect that as I tell that story, I'm probably not the only one who's ever done a boneheaded, dumb thing like that in a moment of stress. I bet I'm not the only one at all. As a matter of fact, I bet there's any number of us hearing my voice right now. And if you were honest, you'd say, well, for me, it was, uh, it was this tax form that I filled out. That wasn't entirely accurate. Or maybe it was an expense report that you turned in that had a little fudging on it. Or maybe it was something that you told your spouse or your child or your parent. It wasn't entirely true. What I'm trying to illustrate is in these moments of stress left to our unsanctified selves, all of us will always grab the wheel and swerve off in damnable directions to preserve ourselves, to preserve our identity, to preserve our reputation. And this is exactly where we're going to find Abraham, whose life we started studying last week in our new series, Path to Purpose. Now, you remember last week, we got Abraham off to a good start because he's just had this life-changing encounter with the one true God. He's met God, and it is real, and he's heard God say to him, I'm going to do a new thing to you, and I'm going to bless the nations through you. And this is revolutionary for him because he's old, and he doesn't even have any offspring yet. So he's had this amazing encounter, and God has said, and, but to get things rolling, you're going to move. I need you to move from Ur the Chaldeans through Haran, not Iran, but Haran, and then into the promised land, northern Israel, called Canaan get on your way. But he hadn't made all that clear. He's just saying, I'm going to show you as you go, where you go. So Abram and Sarah, remember first their names are Abram and Sarah. Later it's going to be Abraham and Sarah. But at this point, their names haven't been changed. So they start moving. And don't you know, as they're following with God and walking along with God, they're imagining what is the promised land going to be like? What is this place going to be? And I wonder if it's like this. And you know how it is when you're maybe going on a vacation and you're like, what's it going to, and then you get there and it's like, whoa, this is not like the pictures, you know? And, and so <clears throat> they're going there and, and everything is, is going along great until we get to verse 10, chapter 12, verse 10. Let's look at chapter 12, verse 10 together. Now, there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. And as he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarah, his wife, I know that you are a beautiful woman, and when the Egyptians see you, they're going to say, this is his wife. And then they will kill me. But then they'll let you live. So, say that you're my sister so that I'll be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. And when Abram came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that Sarai was indeed a beautiful woman. And when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to the Pharaoh and she was taken into his palace. And he treated Abram well for Sarai's sake. And Abram acquired sheep and cattle and male and female donkeys and male and female servants and camels. Now let's just stop there and evaluate where we are at this point, okay? So the promised land of Canaan was nothing like what they'd been expecting. There's famine going on. So picture dry, crispy, dead, and most of us don't have any experience with that unless you've been on a mission trip to one of the places that we do go to help try to alleviate these problems, especially with water wells. And, but they, they, they were having all sorts of problems, And there wasn't anybody bringing any alleviation for them to their awareness. 
And they'd kind of forgotten about God. So Abram says to Sarai, here's what we'll do. Let's go south. So they start going south into southern Israel, which was called the Negev. And they're going into the Negev, but it's not getting any better. And so they get into the Negev, and then he says, well, let's just keep on going southward further, and we'll just go all the way down to Egypt, because I know they got the Nile River, and there's water, and they must have some sort of you know, produce that's coming out there, and, and then we'll have food, and that'll be a better place for us to live. And that'll, that'll be a great thing. Until they started getting nearer to Egypt, and then he starts thinking to himself, wait a second. I tend to forget my wife is middle-aged, but she is still beautiful. And when these strangers in a foreign land see her, they're going to pick me off so that they can take her to themselves. They're going to kill me. So he says, here's what you're going to do. Honey, what, what do you do when they say, are you married to him? You say, no. Say, I'm actually his sister because they won't kill me if I'm just the brother. And so that's the plan, and and we'll figure it out from there, he essentially says. Now, let's just pause here for a minute and ask a question that scholars have asked in, in commentaries. Do you think that, well, first of all, do you think that they would have starved had they stayed in the promised land where God had led them? No, not to death, they wouldn't have. The film can't end there because we already know that God has said, I'm going to do a great thing through a new nation and bless the nations are going to come through your offspring. The movie can't end with you dying of starvation. No way. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. He's just using the best practical wisdom that he can muster up given the circumstances of famine. We'll go to Egypt. Would God have allowed him to get killed in Egypt? No. He's told Abram, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. He's he's already given him these promises. But Abram hasn't even remembered any of this. And that's an interesting thing to notice as well. God doesn't turn up in this passage Who did he not ever consult? He never consulted God. Before they did all of this, going south into Egypt and coming up with this plan. It was a creative plan, but it was a deceptive plan. It was a half-truth. You know what a half-truth is. Half-truths are words that are true put together in a way so as to deceive True words used to deceive. Now, technically, she was his half-sister. They had the same father, Genesis 20 tells us in verse 12. Different mothers. (laughs) But this was not honest. It was deceptive. And sure enough, they did notice her beauty, and they did take her to the Pharaoh, and off she goes. And they actually believe the scheme, and he's the brother, and and they're nice to him as a result. And they give him camels and donkeys and cattle and servants, and they were just very generous, which was great and wonderful, except for one little thing. He just pimped out the Mrs. And that's a problem, right? And he never consults God about it once. Which brings us back to what we're talking about today. Left to our own sanctified, unsanctified, carnal selves, we can really make a mess of our lives for the sake of trying to preserve ourselves. Four observations that I want us to make from the text today. Okay, if you're a note taker, the first one is this. When we try to grab the wheel or the reins and control it ourselves, the complexities only multiply. The complexities only multiply. It just gets worse and worse and worse. That's what we've been seeing in in the whole political thing. It's just like, oh my gosh, it's just going worse and worse and worse. But I was thinking about all that and thinking, but you know, this isn't the first time a world leader has uh, sort of, well, it's just gotten complex. 
uh, I think back 3,000 years ago to the great King David. You remember his story. He was a man after God's own heart. Wonderful King David, and things are going so wonderful, and, and he's up on the top of his palace looking over Israel, his, his nation. And all was good until he glanced one way, and, and he somehow saw over the shower curtain of a beautiful woman named Bathsheba. And he says to his attendant, now, who is she? And he says, well, that's Bathsheba, who is married to Uriah. But I don't think he heard the last part. He just heard Bathsheba and said, go and get her. And so they went, they got her, and he brought him to herself and took him to herself in a way that only her husband should have. And about a month or two later, he gets a note from Bathsheba saying, um, your honor, I am pregnant with your child. Now that's a problem. What does he do? Does he come clean? Does he repent? Does he fess up? Does he just get it out into the open? No, he doubles down and said, what's her husband's name? Uriah. Okay, get him killed. That's, we just got to, that's how we'll get out of this. Just get him killed and then I'll take her as my wife and, and then we'll kind of be in the clear, right? Wrong. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And that, I think, is the first thing that we have to notice from this text today, friends. If we're trying to manage our own reputation, if we're trying to manage our own identity and, 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 and preserve ourselves, I'm just going to make it worse and worse and worse. Doesn't ever work out. The complexities only multiply. And this is what's happening. I'm sure Abe didn't think it, that maybe the plan would ever have to be implemented. But it, here it is being implemented. And now she's in the Pharaoh's palace and being considered one of his wives. And that leads to a second thing. If we're trying to control life, it's going to pass pain into the lives of others. It's not just us who are going to feel the pain. Sooner or later, the pain gets passed. It always gets passed. Who's going to feel the pain? Well, certainly his wife is feeling the pain in this. He's preserved himself. He's alive as if God wouldn't have taken care of him anyhow. But she's bearing the brunt of the pain. And I was thinking there's any number of situations that I could probably use to illustrate that very sort of thing, the choices of a husband bearing uh, forth in pain in their wives' lives. But I was thinking of one thing that it was a long time ago, and a man came into my office. I said, well, what's up? He said, well, I need to talk to you about something, yes. He said, do you know what day trading is? I said, well, I know what it is. I mean, theoretically, I'm not, I don't know how to do it. I've never done it. And he said, well, a friend showed me and got, kind of got me into it. And I was off to a great start, and I had made $10,000. I said, wow, you have to teach me how to do that. He said, no, you don't want me to teach you. He said, that's as good as the story gets. He said, because then I started to lose that money. And we went down to, to, to where we'd started, and then I dipped into some of our savings, and then I dipped into more, and now... He said, I've, I've liquidated the entire gifting that her parents gave us um, as our savings. I was like, ooh. So uh, how, how much is it total? He said, $50,000. We're in the red now. Like, have you told her this yet? He said, yes, I have. That's why I'm here. I told her last night. And... I said, how is she? She's not good. She's upset. She feels betrayed. She's hurt. She's angry. All of these feelings. I said, I'm mad that she is feeling all of those things. And that's why I'm here, he said. Well, the good news about that story is over time, the marriage was saved. And they did rebuild trust and they did rebuild uh, their lives. But not without him having to cash in a lot of trust chips and not without her 
having to work through a lot of pain that he had caused to her. The pain always gets past when we buy into the myth that we can manage our own self-preservation. You'll notice later in this section, they are going to get out of this predicament. We'll get there in a few minutes. But you'll notice something. Sarai never talks. Not again at this point. She doesn't. I imagine not. I imagine as they were getting out of this predicament, maybe he tried to drum up a little conversation saying, um, you look very, very beautiful today. Not today. Just close your mouth and keep walking. You know how last week we talked about the positive ripple effect that our choices can make? If we choose rightly, if we move when God says move, there will be ripple effect that goes out that others will feel. And so if you go out and the Holy Spirit says, tell him about Jesus, and you, and you tell that person about Jesus, and they're like, actually, I, 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 need to, I want to have Jesus in my life, and they trust in Christ, who just got the ripple effect? They got that ripple effect because of your obedience. Now, that's the good side of ripple effects. Today, we've got to look at the bad side of ripple effects. Our choices also cause negative ripple effects as well. And that leads us to the third thing that I noticed in the text today. Our sin patterns create a ripple effect, particularly for those coming after us. Particularly for those coming after us. Let me show you what, I'm, what I mean by this. First of all, I'll use scripture as an example. Um, we'll see maybe when we get up to about Genesis 20, I think. Abram is going to try this same dumb stunt again. It's gonna happen again with this man named Abimelech. But here's what's really mystifying. In time, he is going to have this offspring that God had promised to him. And the, and the boy's going to be named Isaac. And Isaac is going to grow up and he's going to marry a woman named Rebecca. And he is going to do the same dumb stunt that his dad did. Saying, tell him that you're my sister. He's going to replicate the same lie. And this is interesting. You go a little bit further, a few more chapters in Genesis, and you're going to see that Isaac has a son, and it was several, and his name is Jacob. And Jacob has another son named Esau, and Esau was really the one who was supposed to have the blessing because he was the firstborn, but Jacob slithers in, masquerading as Esau at the end of Isaac's life, and Isaac says, you're here to receive the blessing. Yes, Esau. And he says, yes, I am. And he says, well, you don't sound like Esau. You sound like Jacob, but I am Esau. And so he's totally lying about his identity. And he steals that blessing that his father was going to give to his brother. And then it doesn't stop. It goes a generation further because Jacob is going to have many sons. And his favorite of them is going to be Joseph, to whom he was going to give that coat of many colors. You remember how he does that? And all the other brothers are envious and they hate him for that. And so finally their envy gets the best of them. And what they do, what do they do? They come up with this scheme to get him, Joseph, sold off into slavery in Egypt. And then they take that coat of many colors and they dip it into the blood of an animal. And there was no DNA testing back then. And so there was no way to verify. And they take the blood saturated coat home and they give it to their father, uh, Jacob. And they say, oh, father, Father, the son whom you love was killed by a wild animal. A mean lie. You just see it continuing from generation to generation to generation. Now, let's make it real practical. You're like, yeah, that's interesting, but I don't know if I really see that. Yeah, no, no, no. Stay with me. Have you ever said to your child something like, tell them I'm not here. I'm not here. Now, why do you do that? And then the next day they look at you and just as plain as they say, I already did my homework. Why does that shock us when they say that? They picked up something we're modeling for them. Don't you see? We're sending down patterns 
through our behaviors. And that's what scripture is telling us here that we have to be so careful about, so conscientious about that what we're doing is going to get passed down unless we deal with it and yank the weed out of the soul at the deepest root level. We have to go there and get it out or else it's going to keep trickling down into the next generation. Because our sin patterns, they do repeat themselves. Otherwise, over and over and over. Now, let's go on and finish up for today's text. Verse 17 is where we left off. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife, Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram and says, what have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here's your wife. Take her and go. And Pharaoh gave orders of, about Abram to his men, and they sent him on his way and his, with his wife and everything that he had. Which begs the question, how did he figure it out? Well, you have to assume Sarai was the only one in the palace who didn't get sick. It says he and all his household get this plague. Or maybe, in addition to that, she had confided in another lady that she liked, and she seems trustworthy. Let me tell you the weird way that I ended up here. And Maybe that woman told another and another and another, and finally it found its way back to faith. doesn't matter. However it happened, he figured it out and connected the dots, and he brings in Abram, and he says, what have you done? Notice Abram says nothing. He doesn't own it. He's not taking responsibility for it. He's not ripping the weed out, not at the soil. No, he's not. Now, in fairness, we probably have to give him a little slack here because he's new at this faith thing. He only started walking with God last week, right? He's only met God. And the truth of the matter is, as we're getting to know God and as we're starting to learn how to walk with him, it takes some, some time. We have some great moments of faith where we're breaking through, and then we have some really pitiful, embarrassing moments as well that we would like to cover up and hope that nobody else noticed. This is part of it. So we gotta give them a little slack on that. But there was one good thing to come from this text and that is he does get his wife back. And this is interesting. And this is where the story begins to turn in a hopeful direction. We're not going to read the verses, but you can read them on your own. Go to chapter 13, the very next chapter. Read the first three or four, five or six verses, and you're going to see that everything that he did at the start of 12 is reversed. 12 says they went down south through the Negev to Egypt into all of that chaos. 13 is going to tell us they went north, back up through the Negev, back to the promised land, back to the place where God had called him in the first place, back to the place where he had built that altar and worshiped God when they had first arrived in that land, though it was famine stricken. And here again, when he gets back, he calls on the name of the Lord and shows us an important thing. And that is when you mess up, when you've really botched it up and goofed it up and you've tried so hard to preserve yourself and to keep it all together to dreadful results, you know what you have to do? Fourth and final thing. You gotta turn around and go home. Go home to the Father. Turn around, quit doubling down, quit, quit digging the hole deeper. Turn around and own it and go home and repent and turn to the Father. And that's the last thing that we see in the text. The good news is, God isn't afraid of your mess-ups. He wasn't afraid of, of Abram's mess-up. And sometimes this side of heaven, he even gives us a glimpse of heaven and the amazing grace that he has for all of us. Which reminds me, I got to go back and close the loop that I opened up about my own situation. So there I sat in the professor's office as he held my future in his hand. He looked at me and he said, 
Here's what we're going to do. You have to finish the Guthrie text, Mr. Werlein. That is the requirement for the course. And you're going to finish the Guthrie text. I don't know what your summer job is this summer back home. But in addition to whatever you're doing, you're going to read that textbook. And <clears throat> then when you're finished, you're going to send me a card telling me I got it read. Got it? I said, yes, sir. He said, so you'll read it. You'll finish it. You'll send me a card. I'm not going to change the grade. I'm going to leave it an A. For now, though, you and I are going to consider that A really an I, as in incomplete. And before I see you next fall, you will have finished the book and let me know when I get that card. I said, yes, sir. Thank you very much. It was a foretaste of God's amazing grace for all of us. The good news is, friends, that no matter where you've gone, no matter what you've done, no matter what consequence you find yourself having to deal with, and it might be more serious than the consequence I had to deal with, the good news is God is not finished with you yet, but he can't use you until you get back on his path to purpose. He can't do that until you own it, until you fess up, until you get real and honest and say, I've been phony. I haven't been telling the full truth. It's been a half truth at best, but I want to be right with God and I want to be right with other people. And so I'm coming home and I'm coming clean and I want you to do a work inside of me. And we know that he has this amazing grace for us because of who was going to come several generations further after Abraham would come Isaac and after Isaac would come Jacob and after Jacob would come Joseph and after Joseph on and on and on and eventually Jesus, the son of God, would come in to the world and here finally would be the man who would live the perfect life that you and I wish we could live, but none of us ever could live, the life of sinlessness. And he'll die the death of punishment that you and I all deserved for what we did. But he's going to say, I'm going to take the hit for you. And then he's going to rise on the third day and says, says to all of us, if you'll just tether yourself to me, I'll give you life, life abundant now and life eternal someday. So turn to me. But the question is, have you stepped into that life? Have you come home? I'm talking not just to those of you who maybe have never said yes to Jesus in the first place, but to any number of you, you've said yes to Jesus. But like the couple we were watching in the, in the video, there's still something more that he is trying to do which until you do it, you're not going to be able to be in the fullness of his plans and purposes for your life. And that's why we showed the video, and that's why I'll just mention here that Kairos weekend that we uh, have been talking about. Kairos is a word that means a moment in time. It's, it's one of these divine moments. It's a two-day uh, retreat right here that we do. And the whole essence of this is about what we've been talking about, helping people move from bondage into freedom, helping people move from um, the, the traps that they've made themselves, the holes that they've dug for themselves into liberation, helping people move out of the ripples that maybe have been passed down to them from their parents or their grandparents or somebody to, to step out of that and to be free from that. That's what the weekend is about. I want you to come and be a part of it. It's going to be September 21 and September 22. That's a Friday and a Saturday. The Friday you're like, I work. I know this is so important. You should take a vacation day for it. You say, well, how could I at least get more information about it? Here's what you do. Pull out your phone. You can do it right now. Just pull out your phone and text to 797979 the word Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S. 
Just text that and it'll send right back to you the information and um, you can move forward as the Spirit leads from there. I want you to step into freedom. I want you to know the fullness of God's plans and purposes for your lives. I want you to experience firsthand the grace and the hope and the life that he has for you. And so we don't have to wait until the Kairos weekend. Let's start right now. Let's come to him. We're going to have some prayer time. We're going to have uh, some prayer time in both Center Court West and Center Court East. I'm going to be in Center Court West, East. Pastor Dan's going to be in Center Court West, as well as some prayer partners in a few minutes. And I'm going to invite you just to come and make an altar of these steps up front. You can just come as you feel led, because maybe something we've talked about has been brought to your mind. Maybe something that you need to confess to the Lord. Maybe you're like, I don't have any really great confession, but I just want to make sure that I'm fully surrendered to God, and I want God's blessing, and I want his anointing upon my life, and we'll have prayer partners that can even pray over you if you would like a prayer partner to pray with you about that. Or maybe you have a loved one. Maybe you have a, a, a child or a spouse or some other loved one who's gone far from God as one couple came up and told me, and, and they said, all four of our children are far from God, all four of them. And we just want to pray that they would come back to God. And maybe that's who you would be praying for um, today. So we're going to have some prayer time in both rooms. Before we, we uh, do that, let me just pray for us now uh, together. God, thank you. Uh, thank you for the life of Abram. Thanks for how your word doesn't shave the rough edges off the corners of the pages, but tells us all the good and the bad and the ugly. Because roundaboutly, that gives us hope to realize that Abraham really was every man and every woman. We just like him. Friend, in the quietness of this moment, I just want to invite you right now Ask yourself, search your own heart right now and, and just say, Lord, is there something that, that I need to deal with? There's, there's some part of my life that is not yet surrendered, that I need to surrender. Ask the Lord this even in this quiet moment. Um, are you really the person that you present yourself to be? Or is what everybody knows of you really a good effort at self-preservation? I mean, really, if we, if we looked at, together at your Facebook feed or your Instagram feed, um, w w would that really be your true self or conglomeration of efforts to preserve yourself. Jesus is saying, I want you to identify with me. I'll preserve you. I'll rescue you. I'll save you. I'll be your Lord. I'll be your guide. I'll be your companion. I'll be your friend. I'll be your protector. But you have to Stop trying to do it yourself, which leads to phoniness and just a deeper and deeper hole that you're digging. Come to me, Jesus is saying. Perhaps it's a spouse or a parent or a child or a friend who that's who you're heavy hearted for right now. Why don't you just lift them up to the Lord right now? Lord, my prayer is that you would throw open the windows of our souls, throw open the doors of our souls so that the light of your life and joy and forgiveness and grace and hope in future can come flooding in. I want you to do a work in our souls, all of us, even now. Welcome to Postscript. 
Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. My name is Justin Teague. I am the worship and communications pastor at FaithBridge, and I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just finished part two of the Path to Purpose series called The High Price of a Little Lie. Thanks for being here, Pastor Ken. Sure. We've got two questions that have come in uh, since you just finished preaching, and the first one is about something you mentioned in the sermon. Can you explain uh, uh, how it is okay that Abraham could be married to his half-sister? <laughs> yes, because that ain't okay. <laughs> not today, it's not. Yeah, I think what, one of the things we have to remember is, uh, particularly in the early chapters of the Bible, uh, chapters 1 through 11, we're getting a, a, a sweep of history um, with indefinite dates uh, assigned to them. And then things begin to slow down in chapter 12 when we can identify, okay, Abraham, that was 4,000 years ago and we can start to sort of chronicle out from there what was going on um, in biblical history. Through those earliest chapters that sweep through history and through uh, Abraham's life and in some other situations, we're going to see uh, some marital relations that just don't compute. Uh, let's just say when, when you're starting with fewer people, I, I guess in God's great plan, that was how they were able to do that and it was going to work. I think the more important uh, message is not to get hung up on the literality of it or the detail of it, which in today's world would not compute and it just that just isn't going to work and let's get to the main thing the the point is the author is trying to tell us in chapter 12 god says i'm starting over with you abram and you're going to be my man and you're going to have people and um here it comes and and abram responded in faith and that's really what we're mm. trying to drive at um, as we work our way through these chapters in Genesis. That's good. So the next question actually has to do with faith yeah. and trusting. And uh, the question is, when does common sense come into play? God isn't telling me every little thing to do like a puppet. How do I know when I'm supposed to take over versus surrender? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we, we, we could say, well, he was just using his good common sense when he went to Egypt. He was trying to solve the problem. Um, I think, though, that there were several things, uh, one or two, that I tried to mention. He never did consult God, hmm. at least not recorded. <laughs> we don't have any evidence that he were uh, consulted uh, God. And we do realize, okay, you were responding in fear. This was all a fear-driven um, series of events and we don't tend to respond wisely when we're responding fearfully or impulsively. Now, we have some great advantages or benefits today that Abram didn't have. I tried to mention those in the message last week. Uh, what do we have? Well, we have the Bible, for starters. He didn't have a Bible to turn to. And he just met God. And there weren't a lot of people meeting God back. I mean, we're kind of starting, you know, the, the story. Mm -hmm. We have the Bible. We have friends who also know God, who have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the power of drawing near to a brother or a sister or two or three, who not just are going to tell you what you want to hear, but really are going to try to discern and pray and go, they're going to search God's word with you. Mm -hmm. So we have these advantages. We've got the Bible. We've got community. And the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, which, which Abram did have, it was, they were just, he was just getting used to what it feel like to follow God. And so that's why I was, tried to say towards the end, we had to give him a little grace. He was new at this. Um, I think, though, uh, that's what I would say, uh, because we do have to use our common sense, and we don't get sort of these face-to-face, -face, uh, earth-shaking encounters typically with God as he was doing back there at the beginning. 
but we do have all of these tools, and so we lean into those. That, along with our wisdom, gives us the courage to say, okay, this seems to be where God is leading us forward now. That's good. You know, one of the tools you mentioned, uh, the biggest one you mentioned as an action step, was the Kairos Conference. Yeah. Which part of the theme is moving in faith rather than in fear. Yeah. Uh, earlier this week, you and I were talking about how there uh, has sometimes been a misconception about the Kairos Conference, that it's more of an emergency room for the worst sure. of the worst. Sure. And you were saying it, now this is more no. of kind of what the video was saying about maintenance. maintenance. Yeah, this is a good thing for anybody, whether you're new in the faith, whether you're an old seasoned Christian. But you know, we pick up these things in life from the hurts that have happened to us, the wounds that we've picked up in our soul. And these things can form a callous uh, ness in our soul that, that sort of is a, sort of, that blocks the grace. Mm that God wants to, and there's nothing like an opportunity to come and just to, to let God search our hearts and open us up so that there's a, a free flowing river of grace uh, from him to us um, by taking a look at, well, where are some places that maybe I have picked up some things or some ripples that came from mom or dad or grandparents. And I need to learn how to just sort of step out of that, step into freedom. That's great. That's going to be good. That's coming up. September uh, 21, 22, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Yeah. Well, looking forward to part three. I know uh, that's coming up. Yeah. And uh, thanks for being with us today, Pastor Ken. Thank you for being with us for Postscript. We will see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.